Well, howdy, friends. Brian Fleshing of Mad River Outfitters and the Midwest Fly Fishing Schools, and look who's back. Hey, guys. Tim Flagler returns to Columbus, Ohio. Well, Tim, we spoke on the phone about a week or a week and a half ago or so. Yep. And it was 71 degrees. We had water temperatures of 54. And I was convinced, <laughs> convinced that you and I were going to get to go fishing today and we were going to see early Hendrickson's on the Mad River. You had me going. I did, yeah. And, and Tim said, wow, that's really early. Oh, couldn't be more exciting. And I, I told you to bring stuff to tie Hendrickson's and bring a, did. Bring a fiberglass fly rod. I and, did. Three uh, weight. Oh, my gosh. And it was going to be so much fun. And we were going to catch fish on dry flies. We were going to show you all hatches. And lo and behold, it was frigid at one point i couldn't feel my fingers it was it was really cold it was really yeah. cold we had gale force winds check this out man the wind wind against tide the wind is actually blowing wakes <laughs> up the, <coughs> up the river that's wild that is i don't think i've ever seen anything like that before <sighs> Weren't, weren't you saying that it was supposed to be 70 degrees and that the Hendrickson's were going to be coming off today? Is that what I got or did I misinterpret that uh, information? That was, that was just a ploy to get you to Ohio. <laughs> yeah, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You're here. We got to one spot and the wind was just blowing straight up the river and it was, it was blowing the river upstream. Yeah. Standing St waves. Standing yeah. waves moving up the river. So the day turned into uh, one of the most anti Hendrickson days I think I've ever seen. I yeah, I didn't see a bug. I no. don't think of any kind of no. Water. And uh, so we turned it into a Euro nymphing, this guy, and uh, an indicator nymphing, this guy, and actually under seriously adverse conditions. We caught a couple of fish. Yeah, caught a couple of nice little, little yeah. fish. Yeah, little, little browns. Nice little brown trout. Uh, it turned out to be a, a an actually fun day on the river. We wound up uh, taking a, a break in the afternoon and sampling up some bugs. Yeah, and checking out the bugs. So we know the Hendricksons are coming. So yeah, might might be a few weeks yeah, off good. yet. They were yeah. they were awful small and kind of immature looking. But. Yeah. Uh, we, we'd love to have you back, and I know that you will be back, and. Uh, We'd love to get you back out on the mad in some better conditions and show you what the river, but but you enjoy the river. Oh yeah, I, I, I mean, there's a lot to enjoy there. It, it's, yeah. you, you can, I mean, other than the the, the wind and, and the cold, you, you can really see the potential. I mean, there are a lot of nice little, little hiding spots in there, mm -hmm. great spots to get out and, and either indicator nymph or Euro nymph, uh, mm -hmm. either, war, either or, but for, for dry flies, man, that that's just would be so perfect. I mean, that yeah. that opens up a whole nother uh, part to things there. You know, much more water to fish, and, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that that would be a ton of fun. Well, it's when when hatches start on that river. I mean, you'll you'll literally be fishing a run, and you'll swear there's no fish in the river, and then a hatch will start coming off, and all of a sudden there's 40, 50 fish right in front of you. They're just rising up really? like birds. Yeah. Now, now, in terms of, um, we, we didn't really talk about it, in terms of flow, was is that high? Is that that's kind of springtime? That's Does, kind of springtime. It was maybe actually a, a touch on the low side today. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we, we uh, it was probably starting to uh, get a little bit low at this point today. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But you said pretty much all spring fed, little, little springs here and there. Yes, uh huh. The well, it's it's a long history, and I actually I I've told you before that I actually published a book, right, um, right. called Fly Fisher's Guide to the Mad River, and that book came out in 1996. Um, it's it's long out of print, of course. When the last glaciers retreated from from this area, from the Central Ohio area, which was approximately 16 million years ago, give or take a couple of years. Couple, six decade or two, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 16 million gotcha. some years ago, approximately. When the last glaciers retreated from this area, somehow, some way, they basically dug a ditch from the town of Springfield 
which is kind of where the mad winds up. And they it dug a ditch, and I kind of showed you how right it, the either uh, side of it. either side of it. You can see kind of the where the glacier dug this ditch, and all the way up to uh, Bell Fountain, Ohio, at a place called Mad River Mountain, which it deposited all this earth to create the highest point in Ohio. Um, there's actually, believe it or not, uh, the ski area there in, in Ohio, a ski area and called Mad River Mountain. Well, the Mad River comes right out of the ground at the base of Mad River Mountain. So really? it is a spring creek. And when the so when the glaciers retreated, they just scraped all that earth away and left a layer of gravel and cobble that allow the groundwater to percolate up and through. So that that area is just, originally it was just a tangled web of spring creeks. And they just, it just wound and meandered and there were creeks coming in and going out and all over the place. And then in 1917, and again in 1923, well, uh, let me also say that uh, because of this, like you said, that left this glacial till, which is just a, amazing farmland. Right, oh, yeah. I mean, it's all farmland. So there. that whole valley. <clears throat> but the problem is because it wound and meandered so much, the farmers, the, the farmers in the area had trouble. This is some of the best farmland in the state in this swath that the glaciers carved out. And, but it wound and meandered so much that it would flood the farmer's fields. So they, they hemmed and hawed and uh, finally the Army Corps of Engineers came in and uh, channelized it basically from um, the headwaters all the way down to Springfield. And they, they basically took this tangled web of spring creeks and created one main ditch, one main channel. How many miles long is that? I mean, you're talking about 63 miles. Oh no, kidding! That yeah, long? I, yeah. I didn't know it was that long. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about 63 miles from the headwaters down to Springfield, where the channelization stopped. Like fishbowl the whole way, yeah. pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the upper stretch of the river, um, and and maybe someday we'll go fish the upper stretch. I was kind of thinking of doing that today, um, had the weather been a, a little bit warmer. But the upper stretch of the river, in some places, might be from from me to the counter. So it's so kind of blue line stuff. It's very yeah. blue line stuff. And then it starts to widen up. You saw the river where we were today it was kind of call it middle of the river. And that's kind of medium size. As you get down river, it gets it gets bigger and wider and a, a lot of deeper holes. OK, but a lot of a lot of folks, old timers used to complain about the fact that the river was channelized and then that took away a lot of the natural habitat. And of course it did. In, in the 1930s, 1940s, that riparian zone was, was you know, very immature. Right. And uh, I can't even imagine in, in 1917, it was probably just bare, muddy banks because they had to dig the thing out and then. Right. So it's taken, it's been over 100 years now, and the river has certainly, as you've seen, uh, done a great job of correcting itself. Yeah, it look, looks very natural. I yeah. mean, you, you would not know that that's a channelized river. I mean, well, <laughs> but the old timers that complain about that, yes, it, it made a drainage ditch out of it, so to speak, but it has corrected itself. Obviously, the, the uh, riparian zone has re-established itself. I mean, you've got trees and uh, all that um, riparian is, is over 100 years old yeah. now. So yeah. it, it, it's not a problem at this point. The, the river meandered so, so much that by the time it got to really the first town, West Liberty, um, it was a warm water. It contained brook species, which there were your creek chubs and your dace and darters, uh -huh. possibly some smallmouth bass, although I've never seen that documented. Um, and by the time it got to the town of West Liberty, which is about uh, 12 miles north of us or so, it was too warm to support a population of trout. So it was not um, originally a trout stream. There are people that will tell you that this was originally a native brook trout stream. It was not. No. So by channelizing the river, they actually created. And in 1926 was when they began stocking trout in the river. Um, and they've gone through all kinds of different stocking programs, of course, they always do. Um, but it was about 1980, in the early 1980s, they switched over to strictly brown trout. It is not a put and take fishery. They, they stock six to nine inch f fish um, and a, a, f a trout in the river 
has to be 12 inches. So you can't have that follow the stocking truck mentality and just go fill a stringer full of fish. Yeah. So those fish have a chance to spread out, to acclimate and grow. And grow they do. I mean, um, you know, we, we, get, we get a fair number of fish in the, you know, 18 to 22 inch range. Really? And, and then every season, um, every season we get a fish that's 24, 26, um, and there's 20, there's 28s in there. I've, I've caught, really? yeah, I caught a, a female one time, uh, and I knew where she was. We called her Kahuna, and she was always in the same spot. She was always in two and a half foot of water. I could predict, I would float past, and I could predict where she was going to be. Uh, one night, I, I went back just before dark. I was finished guiding, and I went back, and I caught her on a Dahlberg diver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Big fly. Yeah. Yeah. Dahlberg diver and an intermediate tip line. And uh, she was 28 inches, uh, I, I, you know, and I was by myself. So I don't have a picture. I don't have proof. But yeah, there's there's some there's some giant, giant brown. We grow giant brown trout. And we did. We sampled up some bugs today. And you saw some evidence of why there's some giant brown trout. Yeah, there, there was a lot of food there for them to eat. That's, yeah. for, that's for sure. There's a... Uh, those big crane fly larvae. I mean, that that's the that's a lot of protein. In, yes. In, and it, some of those were. I mean, they were they were close to three inches long when yeah. they were all stretched out. So. Yeah, they're big, fat, meaty meals. And uh, uh, you know, we mentioned this earlier today that I, I've always said the crane fly is the unsung hero of the of the bug world and the fly fishing world. Uh, but he's never going to make it on the cover of Fly Fishing no, Magazine. No, it's it's um it's a shame. That's a, that's a lot of protein. They're just about everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, even in, in fairly still water. They like woody debris. And um, I've sampled them back back in New Jersey, where I'm from, almost all year round. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I see them, and they're all different sizes, right. different colors. Um, and, and so it, it's, yeah, and there are a lot of them, too. I mean, yeah. Almost every time I stream sample, I, I have at least a couple. You know, I, I think uh, they are a diptera. So am I right in saying that they will have two, three broods a year? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I believe that's the case also. It's the same thing. We find them in all different stages um, all throughout the season. There isn't a month of the year that you're not going to find crane flies in a variety of different sizes. Yeah. I wonder what flies would work to imitate a crane fly. Oh, I wonder. Hmm. I wonder. <laughs> well, stay tuned. Uh, we've got a little entomology episode coming up, and uh, Tim will show you his uh, favorite crane fly. <laughs> <clears throat> well, uh, you had asked me uh, also earlier today about how the Mad River got its name. Oh, I, I read about it. Why is it called the Mad River? Uh, I'm sure this is folklore, but I'll tell the story here on camera anyway. But the old legend has it because before the river was channelized, the, the Indians that inhabited the area, um, it was just this tangled web of spring creeks, and they would start out in their canoe, paddle all day, and wind up back in the same spot. So it made them mad. <laughs> it's as good, good, good a reason as any, I guess, yeah. about the Mad River. So but... that's uh, that's where the river got its name. Uh, but it's it's a true gem here in Central Ohio. I mean, let's face it, Ohio is not a trout-rich state. Although you are coming back to Ohio to go steelhead fishing. Yeah, yeah. All uh, the all the um, rivers that drain into Erie. Yeah. Um, so we actually have a lot of trout and a lot of pounds yeah. of trout here in Ohio. It's just that as far as the, uh, you know, the stream trout, the non-migratory stream trout, we've got three trout streams. We've, in fact, we've got one of each. We've got a spring creek, the mad, we've got a tailwater and the clear creek, and then we have a freestoner down below us called Clear Creek. And so we've got one of each. The state of Ohio stocks browns and the mad. They stock browns and rainbows, browns in the upper, rainbows in the lower, stretch of the clear fork and then they are now stocking rainbow trout down in clear creek um, and that's kind of a seasonal fishery the matters are one true year-round trout fishery so it's it's, it's a really cool fishery I, I wish i could have uh, shown you a little bit better conditions i mean it was uh, poor Tim was over there trying to euro nymph, and and your your cider was was a, yeah big you blowing four foot <laughs> yeah. upstream of you, um, and and I couldn't even hardly mend up to my indicator. The wind was blowing so hard. I mean that was that those were very very tough conditions 
Um, but hey, we went and did it. Caught a few fish. Yeah, we did. I had fun. So, well, thanks as always, man. We appreciate you being here, and uh, we look forward to getting you back out here. And uh, let, let's go fishing again. That was a, that uh, was a I, lot I of fun. I would love to, Brian. That yeah. was a ton of fun. And we're going to, since we, we didn't really get to talk a lot about uh, the Euro nymphing on the river today, we want you all to stay tuned because uh, here this afternoon we're going to film a little Euro 101 via Tim Flagler style. So as always, friends, stay tuned to our YouTube channel. As always, it's a great pleasure to have Tim Flagler here with us. I think uh, he's now become what we would call a regular, and we, we twice. We, we, we well, but we're okay. we're all right. with regular. I'm already planning the next visit. <laughs> Super. And I, I know Joan is over. His wife is over there planning the next visit. She's got the calculator out and everything, so uh, calculating when they can come here. Yeah. Very um, good. So, <clears throat> as always, friends, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and be sure to subscribe to his YouTube channel. Your YouTube channel is? Tightline Video on YouTube. Tightline Video on YouTube. You also have 18 websites? Or no, two? Just, no, one. Oh, one. <laughs> just one. one. Okay. Practicalpatterns. Practicalpatterns.com. Go and check Tim out. He's one of the one of the best fly tires we know, or one of the most recognized fly tires uh, in the world today, and it's a real pleasure to have him here. So subscribe. Subscribe, hit that like button, it makes us feel good, and stay tuned. We've got a lot more Tim Flagler coming your way. Oh yeah, and watch this video here, and then watch that video here, and stay tuned.